Today we have no new cases of COVID-19 to report. Uh, in addition, one case that was previously uh, categorised as a probable case has uh, been changed and is now defined as not a case. So our overall total of confirmed and probable, by case, uh, probable cases decreases by 1 to 1,486. Our total number of confirmed cases therefore remains at 1,137 and we will continue to report this number to the World Health Organisation as we do update them each day. Uh, yesterday there were 3,300 sorry, 3,232 tests processed at our laboratories around the country and the combined total to date is 155,928 tests. Uh, of our cases, 1,302 are reported as recovered, which uh, represents a total of 88% uh, of our confirmed and probable cases. Today there are four people in hospital and none of these is in ICU. There are no additional deaths to report. We still have these 16 significant clusters around New Zealand, with three now closed, as I've previously reported. One existing cluster, this is the St Margaret's Hospital and Rest Home, has today had five new cases linked to it. It's important to note these are not new cases. Rather, uh, what has happened is following further investigation, cases from what was previously considered a separate, smaller cluster have been linked to the St Margaret's cluster and those have been merged. These are existing ca uh, cases and none of them are patients at Waitakere Hospital. Obviously having zero new cases of COVID-19 to report for a second day in a row is very encouraging and all New Zealanders should feel pleased with their efforts. I certainly do. Uh, and of what we have achieved together over these last weeks. Uh, of course, we must stick to the plan. The worst thing we could do now is celebrate success early before the full-time whistle blows and jeopardise the gains we have made. Stay the course, stay in your bubble and don't squander what we have achieved to give this by giving the virus a chance that it will only too readily accept if we do that. Uh, I just want to talk a bit about exemptions. We require anyone entering the country, as you know, to go into a 14-day period of either quarantine or managed isolation, the former if they are symptomatic. Uh, to date, since 28th of March, around 6,000 returned travellers to New Zealand have gone into managed isolation or quarantine, and there are currently 179 people in the quarantine facilities and just under 2,800 people in managed isolation. These precautions are obviously to prevent the virus coming into our country and to ensure that all New Zealanders are protected. There is, of course, a process for requesting an exemption, including on compassionate grounds, and the Ministry has to date received 24 such requests that relate to a dying relative as you know, there has been a judicial request of one of uh, judicial review of one of those requests, which last Friday resulted in the court intervening and a personal visit was organised. As a result of that judicial review, I've asked our team to review previous similar requests to ensure that they followed the correct process and take into account the judge's findings. I should also point out that it won't be the same team doing that review of those cases, but they are being done by a separate team that is in the National Crisis Management Centre, which considers all those requests for exemption uh, for domestic travel. Uh, so they are being done by an entirely separate group of people. The review started today. I have asked for it to be completed as soon as possible this week. Uh, today is International Midwives Day, and I want to uh, shout out to all the midwives uh, who work in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as both lead maternity carers in the community uh, and our core midwives in hospitals and uh, our primary birthing units. Uh, Ngā mihinui kia koutou. Uh, there are about 3,200 of these essential frontline workers and they, uh, they uh, undertake important work across our communities. And during the period of lockdown, around 6,000 babies were delivered, many if not all with the help of those uh, midwives. So once again, I want to acknowledge the wonderful work they do, not just today, but each day. Today is also World Hand Hygiene Day. Uh, now, that's very apposite at this time, but I also should point out that every day at the moment should be World Hand Hygiene Day. Uh, and it's a very important reminder today of the importance 
of what is a very simple action um, that uh, prevents on, uh, passing on any infection, but in particular at the moment, redu greatly reduces the risk of passing on the COVID-19 infection. And fittingly, this year, the campaign theme is save lives, clean your hands. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm happy to leave it there and hand back to you. Um, thank you very much, Dr Bloomfield. Can I reiterate your thanks uh, to those uh, who are our midwives in our communities. And it is in times like this that we acknowledge the role that they play for um, many uh, mums to be um, within their community and within their whānau, and they always go above and beyond. I just want to acknowledge that. And also, of course, uh, World Hand Washing Day as well. Achieving zero cases two days in a row is the result of New Zealanders demonstrating a level of commitment and discipline to our goal uh, of uh, winning the fight against COVID-19 that we can all be undeniably proud of. It points to our lockdown doing exactly what we'd planned it to do, break the chain of transmission. However, we know the virus can have a long tail and that other cases can pop up. So as we make our way through this week and head towards the Level 3 review next week, my message remains, don't do anything that snatches... Uh, our potential victory at this point. One case at one gathering has led to multiple clusters and the virus getting away on us, is, um, uh, us uh, can still happen. So my message remains the same for the remainder of the week. Stay home, stay to your bubble, maintain physical, uh, physical distancing and let's double down this week to maintain this uh, good run of numbers. I'm also mindful that I have seen positive numbers in other places before, and it's not always sustained, so we do need to still be cautious. Before I come to Australia, I want to give you a quick update on the progress of the support and assistance for businesses and their workers hit by COVID-19. This afternoon, the COVID-19 Response Further Management Measures Legislation Bill will have its first reading in Parliament. It gives effect to a range of measures the government has put in place to support businesses through the pandemic, including helping businesses facing insolvency to remain viable by hibernating existing debt until they can trade normally again. Changes to the parental leave scheme to allow essential workers to return to work without being disadvantaged by losing entitlements to a certain leave and payments. And changes that will allow the likes of the Hart Foundation and Coast Guard and particularly the Countdown Kids Charitable Trust to process their fundraising lotteries through email, phone and electronic payments. These are just some of the uh, innovative consequences of this um, uh, extraordinary time we're in and the resolution that we're finding um, for those problems. First reading of the bill will take place this afternoon. It will be referred to the Epidemic Response Committee for consideration and reported back to the House on Tuesday 12 May. It will then move through the remaining legislative stages as quickly as possible. I've just come from a meeting of the Australian National Cabinet, a gathering of Australia's state and federal leaders to discuss uh, our uh, experience with COVID-19 on both sides of the ditch, what we can learn from one another and how uh, we might be able to work together as we recover um, from this pandemic. The National Cabinet tends to meet in times of national crisis, uh, but obviously is infrequent. The last New Zealand Prime Minister to participate in such a meeting was Peter Fraser, who attended various meetings of Australia's uh, War Cabinet. Australians and New Zealanders travel across the ditch more than they do anywhere else. New Zealand is Australia's second largest source of tourists after China, with 1.2 million visitors last year and 1.6 million Aussies visited us. So we both stand to benefit from getting travel up and running again. Part of the reason for so much travel is that families and friendships, of course, span the Tasman. There are around 75,000 Australians in New Zealand and more than half a million Kiwis in Australia. We're also Australia's largest export market by number of exporting firms. 18,500 Aussie businesses trade with New Zealand, meaning we're especially critical for Australian SMEs. So the case for increasing economic relations uh, when safe is clear. I joined the meeting at uh, the very, very beginning, and I should note it is still underway. And so uh, you'll forgive me for not saying um, too much here at this point, but it is our intention to issue a statement at the conclusion of the National Cabinet in order to provide you all with an update of some of the issues discussed uh, and some of the potential outcomes of that meeting. 
But again, I would note such a discussion is only being possible as a result of the world leading results on both sides of the Tasman to get the virus under control. And I do think that uh, we should both um, be proud of the efforts that have been made and also the, again, the demonstration of the important ANZAC um, bond between us. On to a bit of Kiwi ingenuity, I've outlined a few innovations to date that are helping to get our economy um, moving. I want to reflect on one of those in particular, and that is uh, our vital supply chain, our transport sector. New ways of working have ensured our food and goods have been unpacked from ships and aircraft, loaded into trucks and delivered to retailers, as well as kept our exports flowing. At Wellington Centrepoint, the team's eliminated face-to-face -face contact and physical paperwork, and they've adopted digital kiosks, radio comms, automated way bridges and virtual planning meetings. We've seen that same kind of adaptability in businesses up and down the country. Just one example is how two particular drivers, Greg and Sam, have willingly changed their hours of work and routines to match the different inter-islander ferry timetables so they can continue to get frozen vegetables and chips from Ashburton to the ferries in Picton. I want to say thanks to Greg and Sam. Necessity breeds innovation, and with social distancing and good hygiene likely, of course, to be with us for a long time to come, I wouldn't be surprised if we keep seeing innovation throughout our alert levels and across the country.